Welcome everybody to uh, today's event. Um, Phantom Publishing are very pleased to have um, recently released uh, a book, Judo, The Avengers and Me. Um, and it's uh, been put together and written by uh, Chris Galley, who I'm very um, pleased to welcome with us today. Chris, pleasure to have Hi you with us. <laughs> Hello. Um, just so that everyone's aware, uh, uh, professionally, uh, Chris is uh, Sid Child, and um, we're going to be talking about both aspects um, of, of, of sort of Chris's life, uh, both the judo and, and the film work as we go through the course of this uh, session during the course of uh, this evening. Um, I'd just uh, like to remind everybody that um, uh, you may have noticed in the waiting room that we are inviting questions from our um, audience with us today. Um, so if you do have a question that you'd like us to put to Chris, um, we'll do so a little bit later on. Um, and if you could put uh, that question into the chat, uh, and we will uh, basically um, invite you up to uh, ask the question uh, a little bit a little bit later on. So um, uh, drop those in, and, and one of our um, hosts will select that for you. So Chris, uh, glad you could join us. Um, I want to start off by asking you a little bit about um, how the book came about for you. Well, for a long time, people have said to me, why don't you write a book? Because everybody else seemed to be writing a book and I didn't really think I could. And then um, probably as I've got older and not, not doing so much, I've thought, well, I'll have it, give it a go, see how it goes. If, if other people can do it, why can't I? And it just sort of came together from that. Um, how, did you, how did you find the process of it? Because obviously some people approach these things in, in sort of different ways. Um, did you have somebody work with you or was this pretty much um, your own work? It was my own. Um, I would sort of delve into my memories and find something that I thought might be interesting. And then I'd write about that. And that would be a block, a chunk. And then maybe another day, I think, oh, I think I'll write about whatever, and then try and fit it together. You know, go through the old newspaper cuttings and do the photographs and see if I could jog a bit of memory. I mean, I've got to be honest, having gone through the book, and, and I've got to say, it's beautifully printed um, publication, this, by the way, and um, it's lovely, it's glossy, it's got a fabulous cover on it. Um, but I'm amazed at how many photos you've gathered as you've come through the years. Was that, was that a conscious decision by you to, um, to, to sort of almost catalogue a lot of what you did um, through the years? Well, you see, um, I'm old enough that I've been pre-Facebook and pre-digital. So you, you took photographs. You couldn't keep any memories any other way. You couldn't have it on your phone because we didn't have mobile phones. So um, I've got a, actually a big sea chest that's full of photographs and I just poked about in there digging things out and reminding myself of things. Um, it got more difficult as I got to the more modern things because those things are recorded digitally and then I had to sort of make a definite decision on whether I wanted them or not. No. Mm -hmm. But there are some, there are some glorious glorious photos in there and I'm sure um, all those that have joined us are uh, I think that believe that they should all have copies of the books so hopefully you've all had a chance to um, to look through and uh, and feast your eyes on some of those um, I'm going to start talking um, a little bit about the judo side of it first off if you if you don't mind um, Chris fine. Uh, and I'm particularly interested first off just to understand um, see you know, in the start of the book, it sort of details you the sort of early part of your life. And, you know, you, you lived in a small village. In fact, I drove up to London yesterday, drove past the slough turn off and thought about this because <laughs> I knew I was I knew I was going to be doing the interview with you today. Um, how did you discover, I suppose, I, I've got three words here and I'm not sure which one to use, but I'm going to put all three out there. Did you discover a passion, a liking, an ability for judo? How did it, how did it all start for you? Well, my father ran a pub out in the sticks and I mean right out in the sticks we had I think six cottages a pub and a farm um, and I think we were a couple of miles from the nearest sort of habitation and um, I was at a point where I'd I couldn't do the things I had been doing and I wanted something else to do and I didn't know what and one of the customers came in and said they've got a club starting in the next village and we said well what are they doing and it was 
judo. And we were all like, well, what's judo? And nobody knew. And it, all we knew was it was possibly something to do with self-defense um, and it was foreign um, and we didn't know anything else. So I thought, well, I wanna go and find out. So I went up to this club and they were really friendly people and they explained what it was and they lent me a jacket and said, you know, go on, have a go. And um, I found out that judo is a bit like playing um, some kind of physical chess where you're trying to outwit your opponent and score points off them before they score points off you. And I really enjoyed myself. So I thought, I'll come again. And that's what I did. I just kept going back and, and it became a habit and I just wanted to do that. And it grew from there. And it's interesting actually, because you say it, you say at one point that you, you learned that um, you learned that judo is not just a sport, it's a way of life. And mm. I'm assuming there's sort of a mantra in there somewhere that you've sort of taken with you um, as you, as you've gone, as you've come through life, I suppose. Well, it's part of the philosophy of judo. It's, it's not just, you know, the sport itself. You learn respect for other people. Um, you learn discipline. You learn um, that you should be magnanimous in, in victory and that, um, you know, you should be respectful if you lose, that, you know, somebody's got to lose every time. So it, it becomes all part of it. You don't just go out there and thump people. It does seem to be quite obviously. It's a very respectful um, sport. Um, you then you, you sort of you sort of um, you sort of drive yourself quite early on as soon as you find you've got some sort of a liking or some sort of a, an ability here, and um, you you arrive at some point at the Budokai um, Club. Is that is that is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, I'll do. <laughs> I'm sorry, my pronunciations. Are, I'm Welsh. I'll put it down to the fact that I'm Welsh, and then I that's think that's okay. No, you're doing fine. <laughs> um, and you find the club in London, um, and that's sort of your next step on, really, isn't it, for you? Um, how important was finding that club and, and getting involved there? Well, um, I got taken there when I was a brown belt. What I used to do is, it, 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 every time I went in for a grade in. I would say to my instructor afterwards, what have I got to do for the next grade? And he would tell me, I mean, that, that's what I'd work for. And I got my brown belt and I said to him, what do I do now? And he said, well, I can't help you anymore because he couldn't go any further than that. You'll have to go to London. And I thought, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know about going into London. And one of the, the men in the club used to go to the Budokai every week, once a week. So he said, I'll take you. So he took, I was such a country bumpkin. I mean, to go into London on my own was just terrifying. <laughs> so he took me there and showed me how to find the place. Of course, it was the wrong day because it was men only. So I, I got the timetable and I came back the next day and it was massively eye-opening because it had a whole ladies section instead of just the old woman that would turn up. And, you know, we had a, a ladies instructor and. Um, the whole place seemed to be full of black belts and it was just amazing, you know? And of course, judo is the kind of thing that you never get to the end of it. You're, you're always trying to learn the next thing or you see something, you think, oh, I haven't seen that before, I'd like to try that. Or you want to correct something you're doing. There's always something that you want to learn. So the learning goes on forever. So it keeps your interest. And when you, when you arrived, obviously you're saying it's, it's, you were quite surprised by the, the, the sort of number of women there. See, mm -hmm. I understood that men and the women train separately, but occasionally at the end of each training session, the men would sort of potentially, you know, train with you. Is that right? At, at, the, end of a, at the end of a session? Well, at the end of the session, about the last 15 minutes, some of the high grade, it wasn't anybody. It had to be somebody who was, you know, fairly well high up would appear at the door if they were interested in possibly coming in for a practice. And then it was up to us to ask them in, um, which most people got invited in. There was one person who none of us really liked and we wouldn't invite him in, but <laughs> the others would. And it was a, a chance to practice with somebody that was of a high standard. And how, how, many, how many hours were you putting into training at that time, would you say? Well, we generally did, each session that you did was about two hours. Um, and so if you came two days a week, you were doing four hours a week and it, it, it gradually increased. 
I started off doing Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, which unfortunately was the same day as my old club. So I couldn't go back to my old club. And then Fridays got added on and then Saturdays got added on. Um, and then it was Mondays and Wednesdays and all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And it got that it was nearly every day of the week with the occasional Sunday in. And you said it yourself, obviously there, there was two sort of separate training areas there for male and for female. And I'm assuming at that time, um, reading some of what you, you wrote there, um, that it was obviously quite a male dominated sport at the time. Was that, was that quite a hurdle to overcome? Um, yes, it was in a way. Um, it gradually changed. Um, the younger ones seemed to be a bit more supportive that the older ones didn't want to change anything. They wanted to stay the way it always was. But very gradually, little by little, we sort of whittled away at it and changed it. <laughs> and, and change came about, I suppose, in a way, because um, you, you from, from sort of going through the sort of judo side of it, you, you get your first sort of break into television um, and an opportunity arises for you on a show called The Avengers. That's right. Um, and, in in some respects, you, you it feels like you were breaking a breaking a bit of a taboo there because you went on to obviously um, stunt double for Diana Rigg on the Avengers. Um, so how did this come about, and uh, how did the opportunity arise? Really, well, um, I was working as an industrial photographer, and I had to go on day release every week. I don't know if they still do that. We have to do one day at college a week. <laughs> And uh, one of our tutors was a film stills man. And he liked to impress us with photographs of what he was doing, which, you know, used to get us all looking. And one day he came in with these pictures. I think it was on Danger Man or something. He'd come in with a picture of these people in army uniform um, on a, a judo mat doing judo. And at that time, the judo world was quite small and you, you knew a lot of people in, in there. So um, I said to him, who are these people? And he said, oh, they're not actors, they're stuntmen. So I said, you mean to say you can get paid for doing judo? <laughs> <laughs> because at that time, it, it did cost me a lot of money because I had to get a bus to the train station, then a mainline train into London, then a couple of tubes, and then a bus to get to the Budokai, pay my fees, and then the same thing coming home. All my money went on going to judo. So I thought if I could get a bit back, this would help out a lot. So um, I was quite interested and I got him to put me in touch with one of the stuntmen he was working with. And that man eventually passed my details on to Ray Austin on the Avengers, who at that time happened to be looking for another double for Diana because the man who used to double for Diana had hurt himself. So um, I went along and they decided that uh, I would do and uh, I just change a bit of my hair cut, mm -hmm. clothes made, lose weight, you know, the usual things. And that's where it started. And each um, time I came into the studio, Ray would teach me. It was a bit like going to school. He'd say, this is the script. This is what the story is. This is what she has to do. And this is how you're going to do it. And it's quite interesting, actually, because what you say there is you, you, you essentially came into this and replaced the man who was doubling for Diana Rigg. And it seems odd to think that, you know, effectively they were they were using a man to double as a woman as far as the stunts are concerned. It, it, to me, it would have, it sort of, it certainly um, feels like it broke a bit of a mold there in the stunt world at that time. Well, at that time, there weren't very many stunt girls and they didn't have any tall ones. And I was the only one that was the same height as Diana. So that's why I got it. And of course, I mean, she, legendary Diana Rigg, um, she, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lady. Um, how did you find working with her? Well, I found she was lovely. I liked her very much. Um, and did you, well, obviously, when you were working on stunts on the show, were you obviously working closely with Ray? Um, yeah. Were you having, were you able to have feedback into into, the, into those sort of stunts, or or sort of were you having to sort of um, sort of go through sort of a fairly lengthy training routine for those? How, how did it work? Well, he'd explain what he wanted and then um, we'd go through how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And obviously you had the full wig, wig 
setting and you had to sort of the fairly you had to be set up for all the various costumes and and diana did to be fair have some fantastic costumes in the avengers didn't she, she did yeah yeah we, i didn't have a wig though it was my hair all right okay so you start you're effectively styled <laughs> yes yeah um looking back if you think about it um obviously health and safety was different back in the day um in 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 the sort of 60s in in the tv industry um any near misses or or any any stories you could tell us behind the scenes there on, on from the show what to me well what, what shocked me was i'd only been um involved in this for a couple of weeks and i was asked to contribute to a whip round for a stuntman who'd been killed he'd um, done a fall and it had gone wrong um and we had no insurance so you just you know, everybody had a whip round for that person and his family. It took a little while, a few years, before we could get some kind of register and a proper insurance scheme. Um, yes, and that you know, I'm I'm glad to say things have things have changed considerably since then, um, and that is quite a, a a bit of a sad story there. Um, see, I I read once that um, uh, Dana Rigg was saying you know that, that you worked absolutely ridiculous hours on 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 the show on the Avengers. Is that your experience? We were quite busy. Um, we would actually start um, actually working at eight thirty in the morning, and then we'd work through till about quarter to six. And then they may have called us to stay a bit longer sometimes if they haven't quite finished. And see, um, you, you're with the Avengers for, for a few years. See, um, uh, Diana leaves the series and uh, Linda Thorson joins as Tara King. So you were asked to stay on, I'm, I'm assuming at that stage, to, to stunt double for um, Linda Thorson. It was the series the same at that stage, or or did things change when the when the um, when the leading actress was was changed in that way? Um, things changed for a few weeks because we seemed to have all different people in charge, um, and then it was decided that um, we'd go back to the the old family that we had, and a lot of things went back to how they were. Um, and and did you get on um, with Linda uh, as, alongside you know, in the same way as you did with Diana, for example? Well, um, to a degree, I mean, we, we worked okay together. Um, things were different. Um, I, read, I read in the book that she wanted to do potentially more of her own stunts. She did. Um, it took a little while before she was happy for me to double for her. Um, I think probably she realized that nobody knew anyway. They all thought she did it, so it didn't matter. <laughs> the magic of television, as they say, I think. <laughs> um, and of course, you 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 you're doing judo alongside the work on the Avengers, and I'm assuming that you're working alongside that on on maybe other projects, other films, looking at some of the some of the work you've done. And you have a vast array of TV and film work that you've that you've worked on. I mean, it takes some reading that. But I'm assuming you were working on other other projects at that point, so this work was leading to other work. It was. It, it didn't to begin with because um, some people need to feel that they trust you. So um, when I first started, I was just this new girl that was on the Avengers, but then we would have various stuntmen come and do stuff with us. And then when they start to trust you, they would call you on things they needed you on. Okay, right. Now going back to the book again, um, and, and I said again, I absolutely love the book. I've, it's it's been a really good read. The chapter that I think I've, I've one of the chapters I've enjoyed in the book is the one that you you write about um, uh, when Chrome, um, your Macau, came along, and um, obviously you 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 tell a, you tell quite a number of stories here about how um, Chrome um, came to you and gets involved in the films. Was it was it an easy decision to to take Chrome in and and essentially? Um, take take care of take care of him well um i would gradually got the notoriety of being the mug that takes all the strays <laughs> <laughs> and people would constantly be coming up to me and saying i've got this cat that needs a home or i've got this dog um and i was having to call a halt to it because i, I had at that stage three cats and a dog and i thought that was enough really um, and Diana wanted, she said, would you like to have my parrot crow? And I said, well, I can't, I'm living on a boat and um, I'm not there during the day. And she said, well, um, he likes to have a chance to practice that he won't mind. And I said, but I've got cats and a dog, you know. Oh no, he gets on very well, he'll look after himself. 
And everything I said, she had an answer for. And I thought, I, I, I don't know where I can go with this. And I knew this um, little old lady who had motor neurone disease and she was lovely. And I used to often call in and have a chat with her. And I was telling her about this and she said, oh, I'd love to have him. And I said, but Diana says he swears. <laughs> and she said, well, it's all right. I'll, we'll put him up the corridor when the vicar comes. So um, anyway, in the end, it was decided that she would have him. And he, Diana brought him down and, and he stayed with her. And um, eventually she had to go into a hospice. So um, he didn't have anywhere, so he came to me. But um, I found him lovely. Uh, we got on really well. And I find it fascinating that you, you, you almost end up then effectively becoming almost a double act to a, to a degree because you know, you're working on the films and they're saying, oh, actually we need, uh, we need a, a parrot or a call or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, eventually you're in both Pink Panther movies, um, you, you know, you're in for your eyes only. How odd is that when you think about it? <laughs> well, on um, the Pink Panther, I worked on Return of the Pink Panther and for a while, um, what I was doing just involved me and the um, camera crew and Blake Edwards would sit and chat and we'd, we'd talk about all sorts of things because he knew Bruce Lee and he was interested in the judo and everything. And then he found out that I'd got this parrot. So he wanted to meet him. And I, I didn't realize at that stage that Blake Edwards seems to have a thing for parrots. If you look at his films, somewhere in that film, there's probably going to be a parrot. It may be a blow up parrot or it could be anything, but he has, he has parrots in there, little guest appearances. So he wanted me to bring him along to the next one, which I think was Pink Panther Strikes Again, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so he went on that. Um, with um, For Your Eyes Only, I was out on location um, in Corfu and I hadn't seen a script. And then eventually I got my hands on one and read it. And there was a parrot in it. So I said to um, Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson, have you cast your parrot yet? And uh, they said, no, we're doing auditions when we come back to England. <laughs> so I said, can my parrot have an audition? <laughs> so he went along with all the other parrots to see if he would do. And they said, um, we're not really bothered about what he can say but we would like him to look as if he's talking and then we can dub on whatever we want him to say. So I took along a large jar of peanut butter and then I'd just wipe it on the inside of his beak and he'd be trying to lick it off and it looked fabulous, so he got the job. That's one of the funniest lines. You're having, <laughs> would you like me to bring my parrot along? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the funny bit was that they said, um, oh, he's got the job, he's going to do it but we will have a standby parrot for him for when he gets tired. And I said, you must be joking because he won't get tired. He is going to love this. It's right up his street. So they kept this standby parrot outside the studio, outside the stage for I think um, it was either one or two days, not for very long. And then they realized that it was right up his street and he was having the whale of a time. He loved it, he really enjoyed it. Um, and the pictures again show you, you know, you've, you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed actually because you've, you've worked with so many different stars of the of, of film and TV. You know, you've travelled the world. I mean, you, you know, you've even had calls to go and help in Bollywood. I mean, you know, the, the stories that you've told, and I can understand why you, why you were keen to write the book because um, the stories just, just, just come out of the page really, you know, they just jump out of the page at you. So, um, uh, meeting Roger Moore, I would imagine is quite a, is quite a pleasure. I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I met Roger several times actually on different things on the same, um, the persuaders, um, cross plot, is it cross plot? Um, and for your eyes only. So, I mean, we'd seen each other around the studio. He used to nip into our stage and play terrible practical jokes on people because he was like that. <laughs> um, alongside all of this, of course, obviously, again, you know, you've got now you've got quite a thriving sort of film career, uh, TV sort of stunt career. Um, you've still got judo going alongside this. And obviously, you know, you're working your way up through the dance and, and you know, um, you know, there is now competition that's taking you you know, to other countries. Um, how are you finding, how are you finding sort of juggling the sort of judo side of it 
alongside then the TV and stunt side of it, because it was the flip side when you first started out, mm. you'd been juggling it the other way around. Now, obviously, both are, are really massive in your life. How, how much of a juggle was that? Well, when we, when we had the women's squad, it got a bit tricky sometimes with the training um, because we were required to uh, meet for training once a month, you know, the whole squad together. And there were occasions when I couldn't quite manage that, but um, it, it, they didn't worry too much because I was training at the Budokai with a high standard of people anyway. And so long as I could hold my own, it was all right. Fortunately, I didn't get a collision with actual championship um, and a film. That was just lucky. And of course, either is going to offer you that sort of opportunity to be injured in some way as well. So I would imagine it was quite the juggle. It was a bit, yes. Um, fortunately, I, I didn't get too many injuries in the stunt business. Um, judo, you get strain injuries all the time, but um, you learn to live with them, really. Um, I'm going to throw out in a moment to audience questions, but before I do, I'm just intrigued just to go back to the Avengers again. Um, and you, you, you went back um, and uh, became a part of the new Avengers um, when, it, when it came back to the screen. Obviously, uh, the lovely Joanna Lumley as Purdy there. Um, Tell us a little bit about how that came about for you. Well, um, Ray asked me to come into Pinewood to talk to him because they were just starting on the new Avengers. And he asked me if I'd be the fighter ranger. Um, and then he said, um, and can you um, get some training in on Gareth and Joanna so that they're fit for when we start? Well, that was in three weeks time, which is not long really. <laughs> Um, so what we did was we, we took over the band room in Pinewood and put in some equipment and we would turn up there for an hour at the beginning of the day, every day, um, until they, they started and they did actually get quite fit. It was a very different tone to the new Avengers um, from the original series. Mm. Um, how did you find it? There was a, a, a different feeling about the whole thing. Um, they seem to be um, very careful with money. Um, in fact, mean with money, um, which made things a bit difficult sometimes. But um, we started off okay. And uh, obviously um, made, made a good friend out of Joanna Lumley as well as part yes. of that, I'm sure. Yes, yes. What we did, is, or what she did really, she wanted me to double her. And Ray kept on saying, no, I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think so. And Joanna was so determined about this. He kept saying, oh, you, you know, you, don't, you won't look anything like her, you know. And, and so Joanna sent me off to her hairdresser um, to get a wig made exactly the same as her hair. And then um, she smuggled me into the studio and I, I sat in her changing room and she went down to wardrobe and found two costumes the same and brought them back and told me to get into one. And then she took me down onto the stage and demanded that they did a screen test. So they did, and then they decided that, yes, okay, I could double for her. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. Um, okay, we're gonna open the floor up now then. Um, and I'm going to um, step back and I'm gonna let some of our, our lovely um, audience here ask a couple of the questions. So well, first off, we're gonna go to, um, I'm gonna go to MLB underscore PC who is there somewhere, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you'd like to come up and ask your question um, uh, to Chris directly. Thank you. Hi, folks. Hi, Chris. Nice Hi, to see you. Uh, I'm Al. Yeah. Hi, Al. Uh, I was just wondering, in your career, did you ever come across artists who were reluctant to rehearse fight scenes with you? And if so, what? how would you get around that? I don't think we ever got anybody who wouldn't rehearse. Mm -hmm. um, it was in their interest that they did. Um, there were people who didn't particularly want to be doubled. Or didn't want, sometimes you'd have to wear their costume and they didn't want that. You know, they didn't want somebody else wearing it. But um, yeah. generally we got around it. You know, we'd all talk, talk to them nicely and ask them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, hey, lovely. Thank you for that question. And we're going to go next to David Jones. Um, David, you'll be asked to unmute. Um, would you like to come and ask your question? Oh, hi, Chris. Um, thank you Hello. so much for writing a book. Your your name comes up so much in in conversations about the Avengers. So it's lovely to to get a chance to read your story. 
Uh, I just wondered if there were any, uh, you plan out the scenes and you choreograph the fights, but were there any where it literally had to be changed with the, the cameras and lights ready and you know, something had gone wrong, so you had to change what was being done and it was a, probably a bit of a panic, but I just wondered if there was any well, scenes like that. Once on the Avengers, when I was doubling for Diana, we had a, a fight which involved um, Christopher Lee and um, mm. Emma was supposed to be thrown into a wall um, and we did it, but it didn't really work the way we wanted it to. And I ended up hurting my back. Um, so um, I had to go and lie down and um, it was changed so that Diana could do it in a different way. Patrick and Diana were telling me I should have mustard baths. And <laughs> <laughs> That's great, thank you. And Patrick McNee almost always um, strikes me as somebody who I think would have a wicked sense of humour on set, um, Chris. Yes, he, he was a, a lovely man, really nice. Okay, we're going to go to our next question now. Um, and this is from Ray. Um, Ray, if you're there, if you'd like to uh, unmute and uh, ask your question. All right. Hi there. Thank you. I had trouble unmuting myself there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Now, in in the video series of the Avengers before you're coming on, they they had Honor Blackman do her own stunts and fall on cement and all of that. And I wonder, once you came on replacing the male doubles for Diana Rigg, um, did you find yourself having to teach the producers or the directors anything um, as you came on? What lessons did you have to teach them? Oh, I don't know that I taught them anything, but um, the, the writers were very pleased. One of them came up and spoke to me. They were very pleased that they'd now got a woman who could double for Emma because they could get away with more. Because if you've got a man, you, you've got to have very quick shots because they don't look the same. They don't walk the same. They're not the same shape. Um, and once they'd actually got a woman, which you could only tell who it was if you looked directly into their face, they could get away with all sorts of things. So they could be more adventurous with their stories. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for that question, um, Ray. We're gonna to go to Dino next. Um, so Dino, if you've had a request to unmute, if you'd like to join us to ask your question. I'm waiting for find me. Oh, there you are. <laughs> hi, Dino. Hi, 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 mate. Um, Quick question, if they were making a film about you, and I hope they will one day, <laughs> who would you like, uh, what actress would you like to play you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but what suggestions have you got? Joanna Lumley, I mean, she oh. looks like her, apparently. <laughs> That'd probably work quite well, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, um, they might, I don't know. I can't think of who would be right. And the thing is with actresses, once you, um, change their hair and their makeup. They can look like all sorts of people. So um, they'd have to find somebody that they thought would look like me. I think it'd make a great film. I just think, you know, with, with, with the two lives going on at the same time. And I mean, I come from a judo background, as you know, the, the actual, uh, the fact that you are a pioneer of, of the actual sport and you had to go through a lot of barriers would just make um, an amazing film. If not, well, they are many. You have that, you know. We can. We can go with well, they are, Dino. You'll have to write to Steven Spielberg. No, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm on it. I'm on it. As soon as I get, as soon as I know how to use a computer, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> I'll start writing to people and you guys. Everybody on it. We need a film. I'll, I'll tell you what, Dino. There's enough material in the book here to make I a film. That. That's for sure. I absolutely <laughs> agree, one hundred percent, with you. Uh, I mean, talking about the stunts on 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 the Avengers, um, Chris. I mean, do you have, do you have a favourite one or a standout one that's um, that's one that you you look back on and think, well, wow, that was actually quite an achievement. Um, I think probably the most spectacular one is the one on For Your Eyes Only, going over the dune buggy because that was made more dramatic than it was meant to be because they changed the driver and he was going faster than we'd rehearsed. And obviously there's always danger involved in these things, but was, um, was it changed? Did you say it was changed at the last minute as, as you were going into it? Well, it was a little bit dodgy anyway, because she's wearing a bikini, so you can't wear any pads. 
Um, and it was with the Remy Julian driving team and I'd not worked with them before. I knew all the sort of English stunt drivers, but I didn't know them. And the younger driver was brought to me and told me that he was going to be driving. So we, we went and rehearsed it. We worked it up from very slow to going a bit faster, to be going a bit faster. We, we had it exactly how we wanted it. And then when the time came to do it, his elder brother elbowed him out the way and said that, he was going to be doing the driving. Um, and I, I said to this young man, when he, the first one came to me and said, my brother's going to be doing the driving. I said, does he understand exactly what we've planned? Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, we're all set to go. And he comes hurtling around the sand dune much faster than we'd planned. And I thought, well, I think I can just about do it. But, you know, you, you don't want to, to fiddle about when you're doing something nasty. You just want to get on and do it get it done, finished with. And so I thought, I'll, I'll go for it anyway. But um, it ended up that the um, headlamp came off. I, I knocked the headlamp off of my legs. I broke the windscreen with my face. <laughs> yeah, I had to have stitches in my lip and I got grazes on my leg. Um, but we did only do it the once, fortunately. Sounds like quite a near miss, but see in injuries, a par for the course, I suppose. Um, when you when you're in stunt work, would, would you would I mean, you, I think you said a little bit earlier on you, you've been very lucky with injuries throughout your your career in, in both worlds. But was there was there a stunt in particular that that you know um, was a near miss or, or was quite you know one that you injured well, yourself I suppose, in? I suppose that was a bit like that. Um, and the one on the Avengers where I, I banged my back. Um, there was um, one on the new Avengers where I had to break the windscreen with my arm and she's wearing pyjamas. So again, you can't put any pads on. This is the problem with um, doubling for women because women don't wear big, thick, chunky clothes that would hide um, pads. And again, the safety measures back then, there probably wasn't a huge amount of sort of safety glass. I mean, these days, everything's, everything breaks no. easy and you know you don't cut yourself or hurt yourself in any way. No. Uh, again, the, the, the techniques have changed. So back in the day, I would have thought it was it was a lot more dangerous than, than it looked, I think. Yes, yeah. And they would have a tendency to park the ambulance behind the camera, which would be a bit off-putting. <laughs> Not such a good thing. I mean, on the average Avengers episode, would you say, how many stunts would you say you, you'd get involved in each each episode? Well, e each episode always seemed to have a fight, at least one, sometimes two. And then depending on how the story was, there might be things going on during the story, you know, little, little fighty bits, falling bits, driving bits, mm -hmm. running through fire, that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> you, you make it sound like an everyday act. Um, I have to be honest, that's uh, <laughs> not exactly my line of work. I'm going to go back and ask the um, the audience for a couple more uh, questions now, because I've got a few more that have come through. Um, and I'm going to ask if um, Mark Witherspoon could uh, unmute and, and ask your question, Mark, please. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mark. Well, good to see you again. Um, on the Avengers, were you and Diana the only, only people allowed to drive the Lotus Elan? Well, she did have um, ordinary driving doubles as well. I just did the stunt driving, but um, sometimes they would have a second unit who would go out and there'd be just some part where maybe the car had to go past or some ordinary little bit of driving that didn't need Diana or, or a stunt double. I'm very jealous. I love that car. <laughs> I love the car too. <laughs> My favourite days were when we went on location, they said you can look after the car because then I could drive it from the studio to wherever we were going, do the day, and then drive it back. I thought it was great. Perfect day. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, day. I absolutely agree. A perfect day, a perfect car, that, actually. Um, thanks for your question there, um, Mark. Uh, next question coming in from Lucy Smith. Lucy, are you there? Um, I'm mute and ask your question, please. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hi, it's an absolute... Honor. <laughs> so, yes. So, how interesting or hard was it to choreograph the stunts for Purdy? Because a lot of her stuff is much more dance, sort of fused with martial arts. So, it's not just oh, straight yes. out fighting. Was that particularly hard to do or more well, fun? It was fun. We, we were trying to include things like that. So, I mean, when we were doing the training for her before she started, we would do a, an hour's 
fitness training with a pair of them. And then um, Joanna would have an hour with a ballet teacher and Gareth would do an hour on the weights and, uh, you know, prepare for it. And we would try to include that kind of thing in whatever she was doing to try and look her, make her look as much like a, an ex-ballet dancer as we could. And Joanna's so elegant anyway that it's easy. Mm. Is there an issue with pointing feet when they're supposed to be flexed to kick someone? <laughs> well, when you do it in high heels, it doesn't really matter. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Thank Lucy. You. Thanks, thanks for your question. Um, I've got a few more to come to, but I'm, I've got one of my own to ask you, actually. Um, I noted in particular, you, you, wrote, you write very fondly, um, Chris, about your time working on the Goodies series. Yes. Um, there's got to be a couple of funny stories you can tell us from there. Oh. Um, when you carry it through the swing doors, there's baby. Oh, yes. My husband's just reminded me. There was, um, oh, what's his name? The, the bearded one. Um, Bill. Graham. No, no, Bill Oddie. Bill Oddie, that's right. There was one um, story where um, they wanted to do a, a, a bit where he's supposed to be a baby. I can't remember what the story was about. It's always crazy. And I, I think I was the only person who could pick him up and make him look like a baby. I was a nurse, yeah. It, and he was it, wrapped up. He had a big beard, of course. But, <laughs> but I, it, it always... It, Something like a comedy series, the stunts are almost over exaggerated to a degree, oh, aren't yeah. they? On, on yeah. a comedy series like that. So again, the goodies would have been great examples of how you would have had to have really had to have gone over the top with with what you were doing demonstrably. I would have thought. Yes, yeah, it was. It was all. It's always very silly, but I mean, it was good fun. It, well, I love the series, so um, I, that's why I wanted to just drop I, I, that, that one in. That was the mm. first time that I was actually allowed to fire a machine gun because usually when we were doing something where the actor is firing a machine gun, we would do the sort of main action and then the close-up would be with the actor on the machine gun. I thought, oh, I don't want to have a go at this. <laughs> and we were doing, on the goodies, we were doing the Salvation Army in training up in the Brecon Beacons. And uh, it was a Vickers machine gun and I had to fire that. And the, the armourer said to me during the lunch, I said, can you come with me while we've got a quiet moment? I've got to, to teach you how to use this thing. He said, you've got to learn how to unjam it. He said, because the thing is that in the, in the take, it will probably jam because you, we've got um, blank bullets, which have got wax in them and it tends to jam it up. So you've got to be able to unjam it and carry on. And so we went onto this little quiet area, quiet area. And then, then, I mean, the noise of it was so loud. We've got no ear defenders. <laughs> when we first started off I was like curled up on the floor you know like this with noise <laughs> and you can't fire it with your fingers in your ears because you've got to use both hands <laughs> um was there a difference working for the BBC and ITV well BBC are very mean with their money compared with ITV but um not an awful lot of difference other than that really all the rules and regulations, I'm sure, were exactly the same. Yeah, much the same. OK, we're going to go back to um, uh, another question now from one of our audience. And we've got a question from Andy. Andy, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Hello there, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear you. you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I just wondered, the um, excellent work that you did uh, on the uh, Avengers, did it ever put you in mind that perhaps you'd like to be, rather than just a stunt, be your own Avengers girl and perhaps have your own character? Um, in a way, but um, I wasn't as trained as they were. I, I wasn't a trained actor. I would have probably made a complete mess of it. <laughs> <laughs> Twice in my career, um, I had to play a part, and each time they dubbed me because they didn't like my voice. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't butch enough. Um, on on um, Pink Panther Strikes Again, um, I was supposed to be Bruno the bouncer, and I wasn't butch enough. And on Minder, I was supposed to be the male girlfriend of um, the baddie, the villainess. And once again, they didn't like my voice. So um, I don't know that I would have got anywhere if I'd tried to 
know, be my own person. Hey, you, you, you try. That's terribly rude to be dubbed in that way. Did just one, one other question, if that's all right. Um, are there any of the roles that any of the productions you were involved in? Um, would anyone in particular have, have led you to think, I'd like a lead in that? Well, um, I suppose I worked on the Avengers long enough that um, I liked working on the Avengers and it, it would have been nice to have done something like that. But um, I didn't really think it was realistic. Thank you ever so much. Lovely. Thanks, Thank Andy. You. Some great questions there. Actually, you know what? You could um, you could cameo or be yourself, actually. In the, you could do a cameo in, in the movie that they're going to make of this book at some point. Oh, yes. <laughs> I wonder who I'd be. <laughs> we'd have to make you some. We'd have to definitely make you some. 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 Somebody. Somebody very glamorous in that film. Oh, thank sure. you. <laughs> um, we've got time for one more question, um, and our final question is going to um, come in from Wood to everyone. So, uh, are you there? And can you unmute to ask your question? Hi there. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, just a quick question, really. Um, did you keep any keepsakes from your time on the Avengers? Have you got um, an MOP or cat suit in your wardrobe? No, um, I did actually buy a few costumes at the end, but I, I wore them out until they were nothing. Um, and it, actually the funny bit was that um, when we did the Avengers 50th anniversary, the chap who was organizing it said to me, if you've got any Avengers memorabilia, we're going to do um, an auction to raise money for students that are having trouble with money. So I said, well, I'm not, not sure, but I'll, um, I'll have a look and see what I can find out. And I looked and I thought, no, I, I know I've, I've everything. I didn't have a lot and what I had had gone. And then I remembered my mother had always said to me, before you throw old clothes away, you should go over them and save any buttons or zips, which could be useful. And I thought, I've got some buttons. I know I've got some buttons. And I thought, I've got the buttons for the, the green trouser suit that Emma Peel wore in Epic. So um, I got, I found five, I think it was five buttons. And I stitched them on a piece of a um, card. And my husband printed out some pictures. There was a picture of me in the suit. And there was a picture of Diana in the suit. And we made it into a little plastic wallet. And I, there were a few other bits and pieces like that, but I took it along and I said, I'm ever so sorry, I haven't got anything wonderful, but I've got these if it, if it helps. And you know, they auctioned these buttons and that, they got 85 pounds for them. <laughs> that was a few years, 10 years ago. Yeah. Everybody was just mad keen for anything that was Avengers, but I didn't have anything else. I've got nothing else, just photographs. Great, thank you. Thanks for your Thanks. question, Wood. Um, one of the series I've, I'm very surprised I've not seen you crop up in um, over the years is Doctor Who. Um, yes. And it's, it's the one I think I really should have seen you in at some stage. Um, but you have a connection actually slightly with Doctor Who because you worked with um, a fellow stuntman, Terry Walsh, on yes. the Superman films. I've worked with him a few times. I worked with him on um, Robin, Robin Hood, was it called? Um, and other things we, we worked on. But um, he, I think he came on the Avengers at one time as well. And he was telling me about how he was working on Doctor Who. And it was when it was fairly new, I think. And he was saying about how there were all these weird alien psychedelic flowers. So he pinched a whole load of them or borrowed them and planted them in his garden so that when his wife pulled the curtains back in the morning, there were all these alien flowers in the garden. <laughs> Oh, yes, that sounds like Terry for sure. Um, we could go on for absolutely hours, I'm sure. Um, but folks, it's all in the book. And some of you already know that. But for those who don't, Judo, The Avengers and Me is available from Phantom Publishing. And it really is um, uh, a full story and a very enjoyable one. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for joining us um, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, chat through um, some, only really some of your, your, your life, um, both in judo and in TV and films. Um, I know everyone here would um, absolutely put their hands together for you and um, big round of uh, virtual applause, please, for um, Chris Galley, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much for joining us. 
Um, and thank everybody uh, for joining us as well out there in the audience. Um, we'll do some more of these, I hope, for Phantom Publishing as we go forward. Um, but until then, thanks very much for joining us and um, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.